Welcome back to At Home with the Dogginses. Hola. And uh, welcome to yet another sub-series of At Home with the Dogginses, where we talk about just things we watched recently, specifically on the Criterion streaming service. Because we were spending $11 a, a month on that app, we might as well get the full bang of buck out that app. Yeah, see if we can write any of it off by just reviewing things we watched on it. Yay! The Criterion streaming service, ostensibly the streaming service for, you know... Uh, classic films. Yes, for, indeed. I don't think everything on the service is technically in the quote Criterion collection. E correct, correct. But uh, it's a lot of uh, vintage, interesting uh, oddities of cinema. Indeed, so. Uh, including the subjects we're talking about uh, in this installment. So yeah, this Criterion subseries, which uh, I guess escape from vault criterion. What what are we doing here? I, I guess this are inside the criterion vault or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. We're not we're not letting a randomizer choose it, so it's not mm -hmm. like the Disney Plus podcast, but it's um we are choosing things kind of at random or based on what looks interesting to us. Or if uh, friends of ours here happen to have the Criterion app and you want us to check something out, let us know, please. Uh yeah, we we welcome recommendations. Um but in this case, uh, what we watched was something that you actually uh, knew from your childhood yes, and indeed. I was completely unfamiliar with. This was actually going to be my uh, uh, things we barely remembered topic until we watched it together, actually. Ah, gotcha. <laughs> until we actually watched it and it no longer qualified. Exactly. <laughs> uh, this was a movie called The 5,000 Fingers of Dr. T. Yes. A 1953, uh, Wikipedia describes it as a 1953 American musical fantasy film about a boy who dreams himself into a fantasy world ruled by a diabolical piano teacher enslaving children to practice piano forever. Two most noteworthy things about this film. <laughs> One, it is written by Dr. Seuss. Indeed. And uh, you can tell he has an influence on the production design. The man moved from La Jolla all the way to L.A. to really get his stamp on this film. To get his stamp on this movie that did not end up doing particularly well. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, and of equal interest to me, uh, the titular Dr. T, the villainous piano teacher, is played by... One of my favorite character actors, Hans Conried. Captain Hook himself. Captain Hook, Snidely Whiplash. Uh, I only recently pieced together with Thor and Oakenshield in the Rankin Bass Hobbit. Mm -hmm. um, he played a vocal coach in an episode of the 60s Lucy show that I watched a lot <laughs> because it was on a public domain VHS collection. Naturally. As a kid. And uh, he also stars in another public domain thing that I've been working on a riff of for a while, mm -hmm. The Alphabet Conspiracy. Oh, yes. Okay. In which he plays the Mad Hatter. Uh, oh, bless. Uh, as patrons know, I've sort of put working on that riff on hold to focus on the Blitz Travifornia. But uh, depending on how long the pandemic lasts, I may have to return to that riff at Maybe. a certain point. Yeah. You said that this year he did this is also the year he did Peter Pan, right? Yes. 1953. Uh as far as my research tells me, because I wasn't around at the time, mm -hmm. but... Are you sure about that? <laughs> well, I mean, I feel like I was, but I was just born this old. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't actually experience the age. Um, but yeah, 1953, both Peter Pan and The 5,000 Fingers of Dr. T, not to be confused with the other Dr. Seuss story, The 500 Hats of Bartholomew Cubbins, mm -hmm. even though the, the main kid in this is named Bartholomew Collins. Indeed. <laughs> it, it, it's... Dr. Seuss loved his divisible by 50 and his uh, kids named Bartholomew C. Yes. This is a very interesting mess of a movie. It really is. <laughs> like, I enjoyed this weird, quirky, all over the place film that is kind of trying to be a lot of things at once. But I tell you... I don't know if I would have enjoyed it that much were it not for the Seuss and the Conrad of it all. Oh, absolutely. So the big thing at my school is like whenever a teacher was sick and we would have like a video day, there were three movies that we had available to watch. It w And I went to a, not exactly a CHS the way that Dave did, but I went to like a kind of like a small private school. So those videos really would like circulate around. We had a 1776, a random documentary, and the 5,000 Fingers of Dr. T. And it just was something that would get played pretty frequently to the point that um, it became a running joke in the school, in the student-led uh, plays that would happen in the spring every year. There would always be a reference to either to either Cthulhu or the 5,000 Fingers of Dr. T hmm. at some point during the, uh, the student production. 
not to backtrack, but this is my history with the film, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and I have no such history. It's it always like that is fascinating to me because like knowing you, babe, like the way you well, find the- these ephemeras of pop culture, I. F- thought this would be something that would have crossed your worldview by now this does seem like something that would be right up my alley like a, a weird old dr seuss live action like the original dr seuss live action movie before jim carrey before yeah. Mike myers abomination yeah like this is and i mean a, again the difference is this was a movie that dr seuss was actually personally involved in mm-hmm. and it's not based on a familiar seuss story yeah it's its own thing but like Long before any of those other live action Seuss adaptations, this was Seuss's foray into live action. And it's mm-hmm. this seems like such a Venn diagram of things I would have grown up with, but I it just never crossed my path. Yeah. I'm now fully expecting you to somehow make one of those beanies that's involved with the film and have it involved with something you do later on in the future. The the beanie with the hand on top. Yes. When I put you in in the beanie with the hand on top. I'm imagining Nick wearing it too for this. <laughs> <laughs> now, of the uh, criticisms one might have of this movie, because according to Wikipedia, like at the premiere, there were people walking out 15 minutes in. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it did not do well. And we found a quote from an interview with Hans Conried where he was talking about how this was his biggest role. And he was like, if that if this film had done well, it would have changed his life. Yeah. And it was hard to gauge from the out of context quote. It didn't seem like he was bitter about it, but it seemed like he had perspective and like what Mm -hmm. might have been about it yeah Hans Conrad seems somebody that was like you know hey this could have been an opportunity but it didn't happen at least I got to suddenly work for the rest of my my life though well yeah like to my knowledge he never and and I haven't really studied the man's personal life and I don't know in-depth series coming in 2026 well I don't know I don't want to promise anything because uh what if his personal life was depressing as so many actors were I mean yeah (laughs) um I don't want to promise anything, but I, I'm a fan of his work. You know, anyone who works for Disney and Jay Ward and Rankin Bass and yeah. every, like it's basically him and Paul Fries are the ones, which reminds me, uh, I do need to at some point uh, talk about the Paul Fries biography. I uh, <laughs> We mentioned like months ago that I was yeah. reading it and I have since finished it and we should do an episode on that. In-depth episode coming in 2027. 20, yes. I have read no such Hans Conried biography, but Paul Fries had a lot of depressing elements of his life as yeah. well. So <laughs> another movie we watched on Criterion recently, which will be uh, the next episode of this subseries, mm-hmm. involved a far more successful actor, Vincent Price. Yes. And really, Hans Conried is, in a lot of ways, just a caricature of Vincent Price. Yeah. Like, he's he's a hammier, he, he's a more broadly hammy Vincent Price, and, mm-hmm. and Vincent Price is plenty hammy already. Mm-hmm. But he's like, he's like, <laughs> he's like the mad TV equivalent of Vincent Price. It's, the Hans Conrad would be like, if Vincent Price saw him, he's like, boy, dial it down a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Just... <laughs> and so, like, I don't know if Conrad would have ever had, like, a serious career in serious horror, but he could have been an icon in these kind of, like, campy horror-ish movies absolutely yeah playing camp villains and i mean obviously he did have a long career as a character actor and a voice actor like it's it's not like he was a complete unknown yeah and again captain hook and snidely whiplash two of the iconic cartoon villains absolutely yeah both of which are now voiced by Corey burton as well as most of paul freeze's characters interestingly enough hmm curious (laughs) Corey Burton is uh, has his work cut out for him. Indeed. Um, Corey Burton is like the Matt Vogel of uh, <laughs> Disney animated voices. Yeah. <laughs> I also, like, while I enjoyed watching this film, I could see ways it wouldn't do well. It's like, first mm-hmm. off, like I said, I don't think I would have enjoyed it as much were I not viewing it through a Seuss lens. Mm-hmm. And obviously, Seuss's career as a writer had already spanned couple decades at this point you know it's not like he was an unknown commodity but it's not like he was a permanently ingrained piece of american nostalgia absolutely yeah and like it's not that there weren't people at the time who grew up with his books but it's just that i don't know and maybe i'm wrong about this but my instinct is that seuss wasn't such an ingrained piece of identity that people wouldn't be 
necessarily going into this movie being like, ah, I accept this nonsense because mm-hmm. it's seussly nonsense. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And let's be clear, this movie had a lot of nonsense. Oh, yeah, from literally the the opening sequence. Like, it is very, you know, those classic weird curves and harsh angles and every, of everything. It's like, what is happening here? Well, this movie also tries to do the Wizard of Oz thing where it's like, it's a dream, but the people in the dream are based on people in the real life. Mm-hmm. Except in this case, the people in the dream, like, it's not like, oh, you remind me of someone I know in real life. It's, oh, you are literally the person from my real life, just yeah. in a different context. Like, he has a mean piano teacher. He falls asleep at the piano. In his dream, the mean piano teacher is a dictator. It also does the thing, like, at the end of the movie, he wakes up and it kind of tries to play it both ways of was it just a dream or did it really yeah. happen? Yeah. Even though there's no reason it should Mm-hmm. have really happened yeah then he wakes up and like basically the only thing of consequence that happened is the plumber might start dating his mom yes yes uh which already might have been going to happen anyway yeah and then he you know they leave for the day and then he just runs outside to play with his dog and he's smiling as if everything's all better now even though as far as we can tell in real life his mean piano teacher is still going to come back next week and he's still going to mm-hmm. be annoyed by all that yeah but it's also such low stakes. Mm-hmm. Like, like it's not the Wizard of Oz uh, case where when she wakes up, it's like, okay, but Miss Gulch is still going to take your dog away if yeah. you're not careful. And they never address that. It's just the Wizard of Oz thing. It's like, okay, but you still have this shitty piano class you don't like. And you still have that recital coming up in like two weeks, man. Like, yeah. Yeah. And it's, I'm, I, again, very low stakes, but... Mm-hmm. It, it's a good job of stakes that feel high when you're a kid, which is, I think, one of the things Seuss has always been successful mm-hmm. at is capturing those things that feel important when you're a kid. Oh, absolutely. And it's like um, when we would watch it, like, you know, on these days where we would have like a movie day as opposed to a teacher come in. Um it really, when they would have to, you know, end the movie 45 minutes in because we had our sort of next period, all of us would be yelling because it was like, no, what is happening? No, no, g- continue on for this whole sequence. Because it's like perfect, it's like perfectly ratcheted tension because when that happened, it's when the guards are, stemming, are coming out to try and find uh, Bart. And it's like, it, it really hits you so perfectly. And then suddenly... Time to go to math class. Ugh. <laughs> like, why? <laughs> and again, I think that's part of why this movie wasn't successful because, again, it's the kid Seuss logic you expect from a Seuss story, mm-hmm. but you have to be in the Seuss headspace for it to work. Oh, I think. absolutely, yeah. The the pacing is also bizarre in this film. It is very weird, It and it's hard to get a grasp on what's actually going to end up mattering. Yeah. Because it's like the way the film starts out, it's almost this kind of like beautiful ballet in a way um, where uh, you kind of you're introduced to Bart Collins, the sort of our our child protagonist that we'll be following for this film. Played by the kid who would go on to be the kid on Lassie. Yes. And actually, this movie is what got him the Lassie job, apparently. Because he has scenes playing with the dog here. Yeah. Um, And he is trying to escape but you have all of these spotlight cladded guards that are running after him. He's running from the guards. And it's very reminiscent of like classic, the Lorax and uh, 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 is it the Sneetches? The, the Sneetches. That's what I yeah. feel like it gives me a lot of is the Sneetches like architecture and that the thing. And uh, there's spotlights and they're trying to capture this kid and they're running after this kid. And this kid who's got his little beanie on with the little happy fingers on it. Um, he is surrounded then by these weird alien guards, and then suddenly he hard cut. He wakes up at the piano. It's also it's it's very interesting. Again, Seuss clearly, you know, he didn't direct the film, and mm-hmm. I don't know if he was a producer or anything. They still at least created the illusion of Seuss authorship by oh. like, he had a hand in the production design, mm-hmm. and apparently he moved from from La Jolla up to uh, L.A. during the process and was like very involved from the jump and i and everything believe it and that may be one of the things like i i haven't read any in-depth behind the scenes things mm-hmm. about this but i wouldn't be surprised if this was one of those quote troubled productions where yeah. there were too many cooks in the kitchen yeah 
but where it really worked was the production design because again it looks like seuss illustrations it looks like seuss decor but in live action and it it looks it does look like sets like it's got that 50s movie thing of okay this is a stage Mm -hmm. but it works for this kind of movie and this kind of fantasy movie and this kind of yeah, you know the the whole thing feels like you're watching a play for children. Yeah, uh, the way a lot of family fantasy movies in the fifties do. Absolutely. But I think about how like so, I have a soft spot for the Ron Howard Jim Carrey Grinch movie, but mm-hmm. it's not good. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's like it's it's it, it, it for what it is, it, it hits the trick. You know, there there are things I appreciate about it, and mm-hmm. there are sequences in there I really like as a parody of the Grinch but yeah. not as like an authentic adaptation of the Grinch mm-hmm. but one of the things about that movie is they tried so hard to figure out how to translate Sue's style into live action mm-hmm. and for the most part they do a decent job of it but it's also done in such an oppressive way like the the Whoville sets are so overwhelmingly nightmarish but also shiny happy candy factory as well it's like yes which i think is part of the point because i Mm -hmm. because i think it's part of the disillusionment with uh commercialized christmas and all that stuff Mm -hmm. but it's interesting how they were trying to figure out how to turn these larger than life illustrations into real tangible sets yeah and you know 47 years later this movie was just like here just make it this shape and you're good yeah and like here have a I don't want to say a muted color palette, but a very limited color palette, like like a very cartoony color palette. And none of this, like, try to make it seem real. It's it's like... There is a very Bauhaus design with everything in this film where it's, like, all about the harsh, sharp angles. And uh, with the kind of, like, the unexpected pops of yellow that come through. Like, uh, a classic visual that happens in this film is that you'll get these, like, long, harsh staircase, but then you get the... Uh, these fingers that go left or right. And they're done in that kind of like a Sneetch's style, Mm -hmm. big yellow hand. And it's sort of like a pop of real intense color. And and, and these like grain sets. Yeah. And the familiar Seussly handwriting on everything. And it's one of those movies I enjoyed looking at more than I enjoyed watching. Absolutely. Yeah. Although there were some sequences I really enjoyed, like again, in a very Seussly style, like there's all these, uh, musicians who are not pianists who are in this dungeon captured by Dr. Terwilliker, <laughs> who we're pretty sure uh, Sideshow Bob is named after. Dr. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But uh, there's this sequence where it's all these musicians who are playing wacky, you know, Susie like uh, xylophone esque instruments, but they're not xylophones. They're magnum of phones or whatever. Yeah. Whatever sort of Dr. Seuss thing you'd have in there and it's like weirdly shaped instruments and it's this like couple minute long uh just instrumental sequence where you just watch them play these weird wacky instruments that was a lot of fun even though it was also just a dead stop in the story yeah and it's like they're doing all this very like martha graham-esque dance as well to it so it's just this very like tonally confusing but fascinating sequence which it is uh very much like it will stop the whole movie dead but it's sort of like, I don't know if you can't have this movie without this sequence here. It's sort of like, I, you don't know how to integrate it properly, but you kind of need to have it just to sort of show uh, breaks in kind of like what's going on in the uh, in the story. Um, are you looking up uh, the plumber or uh, his wife? Uh, we are um, both in this movie. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, the plumber and the widow can be friends. So yes. Uh, so, so the other story going on is... Uh, Within the dream sequence, um, the mother is being forced to marry Doctor T, which mm-hmm. is not happening in real life. No, no, it's a, uh, it's Bart has lost his father at some point prior to the story happening, and I think there is, it seems like a potential talking about looking for fatherly slash masculine role models to go to when he doesn't see Doctor T as like a solid one, whereas the plumber is very much like. Uh, a good one for him in yes. his mind so yeah the the plumber and the mother were married in real life the performers yeah. were the plumber was played by peter lind hayes who i was not familiar with but apparently uh 
He was like a vaudeville guy, right? Like He was a vaudeville guy, and my thought watching him was that he was basically like the prototype Dick Van Dyke. Yeah. Like, yeah. Cause he's like a sort of blandly handsome guy, but he does singing and dancing and pratfalls and mugging. And yeah. like, there were so many facial expressions he was making that I was like, just like 10 years later, this would have been Dick Van Dyke. It's like Dick Van Dyke and Donald O'Connor kind of like mashed up into like yeah. a football player. Yeah. yeah. I guess my other issue with this movie was I can't say that the songs were bad because I don't remember any of them. There were a lot of musical numbers that just made no impression on me. Mm -hmm. The one that kind of made an impression on me was uh, the very campy uh, villain song where Dr. T is singing. That was so good. Bring me my ermine coat. <laughs> yes, he's, it's, bas it's basically the Dr. T fashion show where he's singing to his <laughs> servants. Like, I want you to dress me in all the things. It's, it's like at the point where you're just like... Was he interested in women? You guys just like ask us like, was he? What was deal? Is like, well, he allegedly was married with four kids, but it was this, it was the fifties. Everybody was married with four kids at the time. Yeah, who who knows? I, I I do not wish to speculate about Hans Conrad's sexuality, but again, he's very campy uh, mm -hmm. as a performer, and I know Captain Hook is often lumped queer -coded, in. Queer coded, yeah. Well, he he's often included in the list of Disney villains who are queer coded. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a straight man, this is not my place to speak on any of these things. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of the things I enjoy about Hans Conried as a performer is he's got a uh, flamboyance about him that is very fun to watch. And he's great at giving everything. Like mm -hmm. he is, you can tell he's giving everything in the kitchen sink when he is doing his fashion show villain song. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I like to think that this song is what caused uh, Julie Taymor to do the shoe song for uh, the Spider-Man musical now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but there's also like um, Ten Dancing Fingers, which is like a motif throughout the film, which is... The oh, yeah. Because it, it's, it's not really meant to be like a memorable song, but it's just kind of like as a... It's meant to be like a piano lesson it, song. Exactly, yeah. It's, it's like a chopsticks, like uh, a, a little more elaborate than that. But Yeah, because like... like this song is sort of like, because there's a big moment towards the end where the title is explained kind of full out with that involves a song which we'll get to at some point and the, with the expectation of like the 5,000 thinkers will be playing this song because Dr. T wrote uh, 10 Dancing Maidens or 10 Dancing Fingers because it's been called two different things in the film and uh, things go uh, awry so to speak <laughs> yes uh, and again the day is saved using like kid logic things mm -hmm. about about concocting a device that uh erases sound from the room it's very gerald mcboing boing like yes it, it it's all again like everything about this is very seussly and even though the songs didn't make much of an impression on me uh i still think they were seusslier than most of the songs in seussical mm -hmm. uh because again in this case the lyrics were actually written by seuss yes and that's why like the 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 clothing song was like a quintessential Seuss, like listing of whimsical things that rhyme. Yes, like, yes. Bring me my da 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 and my da 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 da. Uh, again, I watched it once. I can't remember what any of the actual mm -hmm. things listed are, but bring me my ermine coat, my cobalt blue suit, and the little pairs of shoes that go zoot zoot zoot. <laughs> so this is a fun movie that doesn't really hold together as a whole mm -hmm. it's very much like a it's a movie that some movies should just wash over you as opposed to watch as opposed to like really watch intently and i feel like with this movie and i guess this might be because of the fact that i have seen this film on and off since i was six it's like i've learned that if you just allow it to just kind of like bathe over you especially when you get to the elevator sequence, which is probably my favorite movie, part of the entire movie. The the plumber and uh, Bart have been captured and uh, they are taken down to the dungeon and Conrad is with them. And then the dungeon, uh, there's like the Strogo who's going to be, you know, watching them. And then there's the guy operating the elevator who looks like a Tom of Finland wet dream, basically. <laughs> and he like, opened the thing that goes and he starts singing first floor dungeon <laughs> there's just something about that just gonna like ah it just inject this straight into my veins basically 
and he sort of sings down uh, the like second floor dungeon jewelry department whips and chains and ankle clips like so like it's just such an odd little sequence in a movie filled with odd little sequences but if you just kind of let it wash over you it just it just hits you in such a beautiful way so if this movie is still on Criterion by uh, the time this episode is released, and I have no idea if it will be because I do not know how frequently things change over on Criterion. Uh, this is leaving October 31st. Okay. I don't know if this episode will be out before that or not. Uh, um, it, it, it's You can find it on Amazon and other places too. Like I know it's on YouTube and uh, other streaming sites. So there are places to find this movie. Absolutely. If you come across this movie, it is worth checking out, especially if you are a Seuss fan or a Hans Conried fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, it It's a fascinating oddity. And if this had done well, do you think uh, we would have been getting a lot more big Seuss movies like this? I fully believe so, yeah. Uh, because I know that a lot of what made this movie came to be was about the success of Gerald McBoyne Boing, the short that came out like mm. a year or two before. And to imagine what this could have led to, I, I'm very intrigued by. I'm wondering if there were any later Seuss books that he was originally hoping would be screenplays instead. I feel like the Sneetches, like I honestly really feel because there's something very weirdly cinematic about the, Se- the Sneetches that I think could have worked. And I mean, I know after this, he continued to write, you know, television specials and stuff. So it's not like his filming career was dead, Mm -hmm. but this was his only live action movie that he wrote. This this is like, I wish this movie somehow got into the hands of a young Jim Henson. And I kind of think that weirdly he could have made this work. Well, there was that... uh... Henson's Productions Seuss show in the 90s after Jim was dead but Mm -hmm. uh what was that show called like the the wubulous world of Dr. Yeah yeah there was that I think it was on Nickelodeon I didn't have cable as is well established Mm -hmm. so I never watched it and I was a smidge too old by the time that that one came out but I was just aware of it uh culturally and I remember at the time thinking oh Henson doing Seuss that's actually an interesting uh Mm -hmm. collaboration even though the actual men are both dead but uh an interesting collaboration of legacy yeah there are aspects of this movie that feel like that they would be very much at home at time with jim henson's timepiece yeah that sort of weird experimental Mm -hmm. less experimental than timepiece which because this is still a a children's fantasy movie no absolutely yeah i also can't uh let this end without mentioning that of course hans conried would go on to voice the Grinch in, I believe, the special uh, It's Grinch Night or Halloween is Grinch Night, depending on which release you watch. Mm. And again, Hans Conried being sort of like the campier version of like the Boris Karloff, Vincent Price range. Yeah. It, it's uh, it's unsurprising that the Grinch would be among the animated villains he's voiced no, over of course. time. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is recommended. It was a fun film it has its very slow moments but uh what children's film in the 50s didn't of course of course i don't think this movie is essential viewing i think it's an interesting curiosity of the time yeah and and again especially if you're a fan of the people involved it is worth investigating yeah so next time on our dive into the criterion streaming service we will be looking at the Vincent Price film Theater of Blood. Yes. That may be next week or there may be other episodes in between. Who can tell with this podcast? True, true. But until next time, this has been At Home with the Dogginses. Later days, y'all. Later days. Later days.